welcome back to the Simons Institute. It's a shame we can't be at Calvin Lab, but you know, this is this is what we can do. Hope it hope it'll be effective um, this way. A big thank you to to uh, Ale uh, for for organising the the reunion. Um, uh, and and you know, typically I say a few words about the the reunion. It's intended to uh, after a year, intended to get people back to be looking back on what you've done, um, what came out of the program, and also looking forward at, at where the, the field should go. Um, and, and, you know, a year seems to be the right time scale. Um, we don't stream the talks. We don't put these up on YouTube, and that's intentional because, you know, it is, you are supposed to be feeling free to speculate on new directions for the field without having, uh, you know, the broader audience watching. Um, one other thing I wanted to to say, you know, in the next month or so, you're going to see um, requests to update the research report that you provided at the end of the program, um, you know, describing outcomes and collaborators and publications and so on. Um, and, and the program organizers will be putting together a final report based on this. So thanks very much for all your efforts at doing that. It's very important for the Institute in reporting to the Science Foundation, very important for, um, for, for us in applying for fundraising to keep the Institute going. Uh, and, and, you know, what we really want to see is um, big outcomes of the, of the program, new results, new directions, impact on your career, things like that. So, so please do spend some time helping us out with that. We appreciate it. Um, and I guess in that vein, we're always looking for new programs. So if you want to organize something, have an idea for something uh, that you'd like to see happen, please do let us know. Um, all right. A big thank you also to, to uh, uh, Jesse Gill. Uh, who did all the organization on Simon's Institute side. There he is. Um, uh, uh, and uh, Omid Farr is, is there in the background as well. Um, okay, so um, uh, Ale, do you want to say a few words about? about yeah, so I wanted to add to, to what Peter said. So I, I, I think in July, I kind of put together a, sort of the, the interim report for this semester. And there were like a bunch of exciting uh, publications that are, you know, in submission or like manuscripts. Uh, what since then has happened is I think, you know, a lot of those have become, you know, mature and online and published at excellent venues. And more generally, I think looking back over the past 12 months since the, since, since the end of the, the, the program, I think there's been some pretty notable results. You know, some of them, you know, are represented in, the, uh, in this program. So I just wanted to kind of add to what Peter said. There are all kinds of beautiful and strong publications. Please don't forget to add them to the um, a, whatever sort of form, uh, formulaire is being sent to kind of gather this information. It's uh, very valuable for, for the Institute. So I uh, think in advance for that, for you know, so sort of carefully like in, in, in noting with these things. Uh, I also wanted to add, uh, um, I saw that some of the past uh, uh, reunion workshops did record talks and put them on YouTube. And so I've kindly asked uh, uh, Jesse to tell this to our IT people. So I, I think each of you have received um, a uh, disclosure form. So you, you have, you can, each of you have like a, a, your own choice of whether you're fine with that or not. But you know, I, I, I thought it would be a good thing for the community uh, uh, to, uh, to do that. And so I, I, I yeah. Basically, I've seen my impression from AS, ACR conferences held online over the few months, last few months, crypto, then uh, TCC, then Asia Crypt. I felt like there was lively discussion despite everything being sort of on YouTube. And uh, so uh, I think that that would strike that a reasonable balance for, um, yeah. So just, just to add to that. I hope, I'm assuming Peter is fine because I saw Pastor Union workshop doing it. So I kind of didn't do that. Uh, yeah, I just told Justin to do so, but uh, I hope it's fine. Um, either way, again, if you feel uncomfortable, it's completely fine. Nobody's gonna like you know, pressure you, just like, you know, don't, don't sign the consent form. And um, with that, you know, we do have a, a pretty exciting firm today. Uh, uh, we have a, in between, I think, reasonably generous breaks uh, uh, for fueling up and otherwise. Um, um, I think we can use the gather.town in between also, not just uh, during the bigger sort of so-called lunch break. Um, and so yeah, I'll try to stick around and gather a town in general and you know, feel free to join as well. Um, and with that, are there any questions about the format or um, 
Yeah, I think we should just generally, you know, ask questions. I think it's a good thing, and uh, uh, it's pretty intimate right now. Hopefully, become less intimate, but uh, uh, hard to imagine more intimate than this. Yeah. Um, with that, maybe we should just get started. And I think Ron has the first slot, and uh, yeah. uh, and the, the virtual stage is, is yours. And okay. thank you everybody for preparing talks. Um, Can you hear me? Can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Great to see uh, everyone, even though it's just virtual. Um, so my talk is going to be about local proofs approaching the witness length. This is a joint work with uh, Noga Ronsvi. And before I start the kind of technical talk, you know, because this is a reunion, I thought maybe to start off uh, by reminiscing about the good old days, where we could do all kinds of neat things like fly on airplanes and go to a restaurant. Or, you know, visit the Simons Institute and go to the Golden Gate Bridge on a beautiful, clear day and even do a little bit of a research. So uh, apologies to Nick Spooner, who's uh, cut in half. It's the best picture that I had uh, of actual work being done and people uh, in the photo. Um, but more generally, what I want to say, you know, sorry? What is a restaurant? Um, I don't remember uh, such a thing. Uh, well, I'll tell you about it someday. Um, yeah, so I just want to take the opportunity to thank the organizers of, of the workshop and this reunion uh, for organizing a, a great program that I really enjoyed. Okay, so onto the kind of more technical talk. And, uh, you know, the thing you should have in mind in this talk is PCPs, which I think we all probably uh, have know and hopefully love. And I know that uh, I think maybe almost everyone here is an expert, but because it's being recorded, I'm going to go no, not too slowly, but I will go over definitions uh, quickly. So what is a PCP? Well, it's a way to take, you know, an incredibly complex proof like the one that we have on this, on this uh, blackboard and encode it, write it down in a different format that you can verify by only reading very few bits. And, you know, probably all know the definition, but let's go through it quickly. So we're trying to check whether, uh, you know, statement X is true, it belongs to language L. Our verifier is given X, it's given Oracle access. To a proof stream pi, which it can query in a few locations. And what it requires is that if X is in the language, there exists a proof that will convince our verifier. If X is not the language, then no matter what proof you write down, our verifier is going to reject with uh, or you know accept with probability at most half. So the, the verifier is probabilistic, of course. And the key parameters that we are going to focus on in this talk are the number of queries, number of bits that the verifier reads, and the proof length. There are other things that you people do care about, but that's the focus, uh, our focus for today. Okay, so we have this notion of PCPs and it turns out that we also can actually build them. In particular, we have this you know, amazing PCP theorem proven in the early 90s, which tells us that you can take any classical standard proof, any, any NP proof, and encode it into a PCP that can be verified by only reading the constant number of bits and with only polynomial overhead. It's a really amazing result. And it's good to kind of reflect back on how amazing it is because it's been really transformative on a number of fields. So starting from complexity, you know, it's kind of uh, rewritten the entire field of hardness of approximation. And it's had uh, amazing impacts on circuit lower bound. So results by Ryan and others. Um, more recently, uh, in the last uh, Fox and Stock, we've heard of uh, matrix rigidity, uh, lower bounds from, uh, from PCPs, carp lipton collapse theorems, and, you know, the list goes on. So, a lot of influence on complexity theory. And also, of course, a huge influence on cryptography, where it was used, you know, starting with works by, by Killian and Mikali to construct succinct argument systems. Um, and we've seen a lot of work on that, especially in recent years, to ranging to, you know, results on zero knowledge proofs, in particular, you know, non black box techniques of Barak rely on, on PCPs. Uh, so, really, a huge influence. And something that I think is also incredibly remarkable is that this really very theoretical work has in recent years also become very practical. So there are, uh, you know, startup companies, um, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of money going into actually uh, building and deploying PCPs and their variants. Okay, so it's becoming something that's actually being used, which is, I think is really remarkable. Okay, so the focus of our talk today is about making our PCPs shorter, you know? How short can our PCPs be? This continuation of a long line of work. And the key question here, which remains open, and we're going to rephrase it in a second, but you know, if you take uh, whatever problem that you like that you can verify uh, non-deterministically in time t, 
can you construct a PCP, a constant query PCP for that problem, where the length of the PCP, say, is just linear in T? Can you do kind of get PCPs with just a constant overhead? And that question is open, but it's also kind of, it's a little bit annoying because it really heavily depends on the computational model. So if you define, you know, n times is usually defined with respect to Turing machines, and if you switch to asking about, you know, a multi-tape Turing machine or something, then there are some logarithmic overheads involved and the question, you know, won't resolve for that computational model. So the, the, really the, the question that the community has settled on is looking at the computational model of Boolean circuits. And the way that you can frame that question is there is whether circuit set, C set, has a piece, constant query PCP where the proof length is linear in the size of the circuit. And so, so that, that is entirely open. And you know, if you really don't like Boolean circuits, just know that this would also give you uh, kind of PCPs with a single logarithmic factor for Turing machines. So I think it's a really natural question, but if you don't like it just because it's natural, here are some like more concrete motivation. By the way, stop me with questions at any time. Elon, you, you had a question or? Yeah, so um, the, so now you said it depends on the model and then you set up for this uh, specific question. Does it depend on what, and like the circuit and, and what uh, gates you allow and the fan in and? Um, I mean, so basically, yes, it depends on the, the, the concrete computational model. If your computational model can be, you know, um, emulated by Boolean circuits with constant overhead, then that would also solve it for your model. So depending on your, your point. Yeah. So, so when you say better question, you mean circuits, which circuits? Right. I, so, um, for CSAT, I, I think the typical result, it's typically stated for constant fan in circuits. Ali, you're welcome to correct me if, if I'm wrong. Um, and then, you know, the basis of gates, if it's just constant fan and you can emulate with constant overhead. Yeah, or, or just count edges if you want unbounded uh, fan edges. Right. Yeah, even better. Yeah, existing, uh, at least the results on linear size uh, PCPs with sublinear query complexity are for, uh, you know, fan in two, and it's explicitly used in the construction that the, the, the fan in is, a, is a, some known constant. Uh, so you just ignore. Actually related to uh, the second of two results that I'm going to mention. So maybe I'll, if I remember, I'll bring it up there. Um, so if you like the question, great. If you don't like it and want more motivation, well, first motivation that I want to mention is to, towards construction of succinct argument systems. And actually it turns out that there, uh, the length of the proof is not the most important thing in the world. What actually really matters is the complexity of generating the proof. But you know, the length of the proof is a lower bound on the complexity of generating the proof. So if you want efficient proof, you better have uh, short PCPs. Okay, so it's kind of a bottleneck towards getting efficient provers, which is really important in succinct arguments. And second, uh, so having very short PCPs is going to be useful to get hardness of approximation results in fine-grained complexity. So beyond what we, what we currently know, there's some really interesting open questions there. Okay, so what is the state of the art? We want constant overhead. Turns out that we were very close to that and we have been for the past 15 years. So for circuits that we know PCPs with constant query complexity and uh, you know, quasi-linear proof length. So the name of the game is really reducing this poly log down to a constant. And it turns out we even know how to do that. So work by uh, Ben Sasson, Kaplan, Kuparty and Meir actually gets linear overhead in the proof length. But unfortunately, the, the query complexity is very far from what we would like it to be. So it's something like n to the epsilon, and the epsilon has a heavy dependence. Uh, there's a heavy dependence on epsilon in the proof length. OK, so that's the state of the art. And today, we're not going to uh, you know, improve the state of the art for PCPs. But rather, we're going to look at a relaxation of the notion of PCPs, which again, I think many of you are familiar with. So it's something called an interactive oracle proof, introduced in two independent works, but one by uh, Ben Sasson, Kiesa, and Spooner, and the other in a joint work together with uh, Omar Ryan Gold and Guy Rothblum. So it's an interactive oracle proof. It's basically kind of a hybrid between an interactive proof, a public one interactive proof, and a PCP. So the way that the game works is as follows. We have a verifier and a prover, like an interactive proof. And now the verifier sends over a long string, like a PCP. Now, rather than you know, having the verifier just query it and decide whether to accept or reject, the verifier tosses some coins, sends them over to the prover. And now the prover is allowed to send another PCP string, another long string. 
And you know, they continue on like this for a number of rounds. At the very end of the protocol, the verifier can decide you know, a bunch of points in, every, in each one of these PCPs or each one of these long messages, read those, and then decide whether to accept or reject. So of course, the one round version of this would be a PCP. And if you let one query everything, what you would get is an interactive proof. OK, so it seems like a somewhat strange model. And you might argue that it's uh, unnatural. And you know, I don't want to go into that debate. What I do want to say is, is that you know, there's great motivation for this. Because this model can be used as an incredibly useful abstraction, at least in two ways that I know of. So first of all, in this work with uh, Guy and Omer, we used it to construct something that's called a doubly efficient interactive proof. So proof systems with statistical soundness in which both the prover and the verifier are efficient. And it's also uh, it was used in this work of uh, Ben Sasson, Kies, and Spooner to construct succinct arguments. And there's been a lot of work on that since then. Okay, so there's a lot of motivation for, for this model. Moreover, it turns out that you can do things in this model that we just don't know how to do with PCPs. In particular, uh, work by Ben Sasson, Kiesa, Gabison, Ryabzev, and Spooner uh, from a couple of years ago actually showed that you can construct IOPs with a constant number of queries and linear communication for CircuitSat. Okay, so kind of the, the constant rate question for IOPs was already known. And what we do in this work is kind of improve on that result in, in two ways, which I will discuss. But one thing I want to point out is, you know, in terms of the actual communication in, in this result that I'm mentioning, if we kind of borrow terminology from error correcting codes and look at the rate of the IOP, which is basically just the size of the circuit divided by the communication, we would kind of, the rate that you'd get here is something that's pretty close to zero. Uh, I think I checked it and it was 0. 0.00 something, uh, maybe 0. 0.005, I think. So kind of close to zero. And our first main result is constructing an IOP for circuit stat in which the rate approaches one. So almost no overhead on top of the size of the circuit. So more formally, we show an IOP with a constant number of queries and with communication arbitrarily close to the circuit size. Okay, and a couple of remarks about this theorem. So our round complexity is constant. It's, it's a small constant, but I think it's a slightly larger constant than in the previous work. Independent our, of epsilon? Sorry? Independent, independent yeah. of epsilon? Yes. Fixed, fixed constant. I think it's a single digit. I don't recall what it is exactly. Um, something like six-ish. Uh, anything that previous, uh, previous work was maybe four-ish. No, same ballpark. Um, so in terms of running time, both the prover and verifier are quasi-linear in the input, which is a circuit. And we can also achieve some subconstant values of epsilon, but then your query complexity goes up. And also we can do this for you know arbitrarily small epsilon, but for some subconstant values of epsilon, and that kind of gives you an IOP with just additive overhead. Okay, so questions about the first result? Whoops. Okay, so, um, so so where is the cost? Uh, like, wh what do you pay in when you get when you plug in a very small epsilon? So it increases the query complexity. Um, I think at some point it will go into the proof length, but uh, I don't have it on top of my head. Okay, uh, let's take it offline and I'll double check. Okay, so uh, that was the first main result. The second main result that I want to tell you. For that, I want a little bit of context. So let's look again at this question about the length of PCPs. And specifically, let's think of you know, uh, satisfiability, um, say uh, uh, CNF set, where you have N variables and N clauses. So the length of the NP witness is of course just a satisfying assignment, it has length N. But if you look at the length of the PCP, it's always kind of consistent, it's always proportional to the non-deterministic verification time of this language, which in this case is kind of linear in M plus N. So you'd get even the best PCPs that we have and the best IOPs would have length M plus N. And sometimes N can be significantly smaller than N. And it's natural to ask, you know, the unencoded proof is N bits. What is the, you know, can you get something that is just polynomial in N, maybe even just linear in N? And it turns out that the question, the answer to this is no, at least under some complexity assumptions, standard complexity assumptions, 
Fort Knox and Santa Anna showed that you know this is impossible. But luckily enough, it turns out that if you look at IOPs, then a result by Kalai and Raz stated in a somewhat different model, but in modern terms, this is an IOP. This will give you an IOP with poly n length, something you just cannot do with PCPs. Okay, so you get you know some uh, so for SAT, Kalai and Raz show uh, IOP with poly n length. And our second main result improves on that. So let's ignore for the second the first sentence and focus on the second sentence. What we give is an IOP, say for SAT, in which the, the amount of communication is um, you know, one plus epsilon times the original witness times you know, n. And the, so th that's the result. The sentence that I wanted to, uh, you to ignore for, for the moment basically says that this is true not for all NP relations, but rather all NP relations in which you can verify membership, verify correctness in bounded, in some fixed bounded polynomial space. Okay, so for SAT, you can do this with uh, something like logarithmic space. So some remarks about this result. Well, in terms of the richness of the class that we can capture, it captures a lot of interesting NP problems. In particular, things like I said SAT and Meltonicity, essentially all 21 of CARP's original NP complete problems can, can be framed this way. Um, there's a small asterisk there, but let's ignore that. So that's one comment. Uh, in terms of communication, even ignoring the fact that the proof is local, just in terms of uh, the number of bits that we're sending, we are uh, essentially optimal up to the additive factors. And this is assuming, you know, the randomized strong exponential time hypothesis. Um, let me not go into what that means, but it's a, you know, it's a complexity of assumptions that some people believe in and it will be amazing to refute. Lastly, I mentioned that the second main result actually implies the first main result because circuit satisfiability can be verified. It has an NP witness, which is just the assignment to all the gates or all the wires, if you like. And that can be verified in you know, a very small space, just go over everything. Right? And, and I'm going back to your question about the format of the circuit. If you look at this result, what do you care about is just the, it's more about the length of the uh, witness and not about the, the actual representation, as long as it's something you can verify in small space. Okay, so, so, so why, uh, can you verify, uh, why can you verify this in small space, like the circuit uh, satisfiability? Oh, so if the witness is the assignment to all the gates. Okay, so uh, how am I doing on time? You know, I haven't been measuring, but I guess we... we <laughs> okay, I'll we, just go out for the best. I think uh, we, we, the slot was like 30 minutes, right? So uh, I think the main concern is just to leave some, uh, some, uh, some break time uh, in between okay. talks, but beyond that, uh, okay. it's pretty okay. fun. So, Thanks, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, how we do this. And uh, to kind of get started, let's do a very quick slide of background on error correcting code. So what is an error correcting code? Just a function mapping you know, k bits to n bits. It's an injective function. It's kind of a length increasing or, or expanding, um, right? So on the left, on the left, left ball is kind of a set of messages. They live in, in 0, 1 to the k. On the right, you have a set of code words that live in 0, 1 to the n. And we're trying to have the code words be far from one another. So that if you get some corrupt code word, you can, you can decode. And the two main um, parameters that we're going to care about are the rate of the code, just kind of how much overhead you need to introduce in order to do this, and basically just k over n. And the second thing is the distance of the code or relative distance of the code, which just measures you know, the minimal relative distance between any two code words, minimum, minimal relative Hamming distance. And in this talk, all the codes that we're going to talk about are linear codes, which just means that they are linear transformations, say over GF2. Okay, so uh, let's use codes to build PCPs and IOPs. And I'm going to focus first on the problem of doing this for just three sat, you know, as a, it's a very nice MP complete problem. I'm going to show you an IOP for three sat with square root M query complexity roughly. And later on, we'll see how to extend this to get, you know, instead of just three sat, get this much richer class of all MP relations that can be verified in bounded polynomial space and also reduce the query complexity to a constant. But right now we have this goal of just doing three sat and just this uh, 
square root m query complexity. Okay, so how do people you know, build PCPs? And I think that a good bird's eye view of how it's done, if you look at three side, is something as follows. So you know, the input is a formula uh, phi on n, on n bits, and the witness is a satisfying assignment for phi. And you know, the way usually PCPs work is something as follows, not always, but usually, it would be something as follows. So the prover sends over an error corrected encoding of x of the satisfying assignment. And this code C is chosen to be both locally testable and locally correctable. I don't want to define what these things mean, but what it essentially means is that the prover kind of has to send over a valid code word. You can do some corruption, but they, somehow they won't matter. So effectively, the prover has to send over a valid code word. And lastly, the code is designed to have some, some, some sort of mechanism to check that the message that is encoded within satisfies the formula fee. And notice that this check that we're doing is a nonlinear check, right? That uh, X satisfies the formula fee is typically be a nonlinear test that you're trying to do. And in order to check nonlinear relations, something that is usually used is something that's called a multiplication code. What's a multiplication code? Well, loosely speaking, it's a code where if you take two code words and you take their pointwise product, what you get is still a code word of some maybe related code but it kind of, it has distance. Okay, so a good example to have in mind is something like reed solomon code in which the code words are just, uh, you know, truth tables of polynomials. And if you take two polynomials and take their product together, what you get is another polynomial of somewhat larger degree, but it's still a polynomial. Still lives in a code, still has distance. And the same is true for things like reed muller codes or, or uh, AG uh, direct geometry codes. And turns out that multiplication codes are great because they're somehow, they're really the mechanism that lets us check nonlinear relations. And this was uh, beautifully articulated in work of, of Ormier from, uh, from 2013, a while ago. And we're going to be talking a lot about his, his work. It was very influential for, for our work. Um, so that's the, the nice thing about multiplication codes. The unfortunate thing about them is that their rate is typically very bad. Usually it's close to zero and subconstant uh, usually. And in, in particular, it turns out that the rate is inherently at most one half. So there's a theorem showing that you know, multiplication codes always have rate at most one half. And in our setting where we're aiming to have rate close to one, we simply cannot, uh, we cannot, uh, what's the word I'm sort of looking for? We, we, ju we just cannot afford to send over C of X of C as a multiplication code. So we're going to uh, ignore that momentarily and proceed on and try to build PCPs. Okay, so I'll do a quick crash course on how PCPs uh, kind of used to be built. This is a very kind of 90s way of how PCPs are built. Uh, so let's go on for, for a couple of slides of how PCPs used to be built and let's see how we're going to use that. Okay, so we're, remember we have an input formula phi. We have a witness X, which is a satisfying assignment for phi. First thing that we're going to do is kind of look at uh, the satisfying assignment as a truth table of a function. So we have a function capital X mapping log n bits to zero one with just, you know, the truth table is X. We're going to take the multilinear extension of X. So this is just uh, the unique individual degree one polynomial that agrees with X on all Boolean inputs. Okay, so that's our X hat. And you know, for starters, let's assume that it's okay for the prover to just send over x hat. And, you know, in parentheses, I'll just mention that this x hat, as I defined it, has super polynomial length. So we definitely don't want to actually send over x hat. But for the moment, let's imagine that it's okay to send over x hat. Okay, so we have x hat in mind. Let's see how we kind of arithmetize. Well, first thing, first thing that I want to do is define another function. It's called i sub phi which basically represents uh, you know, the, the formula phi as a function. So you know, given indices i1, i2, and i3 of three variables and bits b1, b2, and b3, i sub phi on that input outputs one if our formula contains uh, the, the clause corresponding to you know, x i1 equal to a b1 or x i2 equal to b2 or x i3 equal to b3. Okay, so if you look at uh, the function i sub phi directly corresponds to our formula, which closet it has and which closet it doesn't have. 
And using I sub phi, I want to define another polynomial called P, which has kind of the same inputs as I sub phi has, but these inputs now live in the field. And the way that P is defined is as follows. So rather than, uh, okay, so, so let's start this definition and see what it means. So if I plug in Boolean values to P, then what do I get? I plug in I1, I2, I3, B1, B2, and B3. If the, the, the corresponding clause doesn't appear at all in phi, then I'm going to get a zero from the first term of this product. If the clause does appear, then the way I've set up the second part, the, I will get a zero only if and only if that clause is satisfied. Right, if, there, if for one of the j's, x hat ij minus bj is equal to zero. In other words, our formula phi is satisfied by x if and only if the polynomial p that I've just defined is identically zero on all Boolean inputs. And I want to point out that uh, this function phi that I've defined is indeed a polynomial because I took the low degree extension of i sub phi, that's a low degree polynomial, and I took its product with a bunch of other polynomials. And here's where really I'm leveraging multiplication codes. I took you know, code words and I multiplied them. Okay, so how do I check that my polynom polynomial P vanishes on Boolean inputs? Well, the short answer is to use sum check, the beautiful uh, celebrated sum check protocol of Lund, Ford, now Carlo, and Nissan. The longer answer is that, you know, sum check was designed to let you check that a sum over say the Boolean hypercube is equal to zero, but it turns out that there's a very close variant that lets you check that it's just identically zero on the hypercube. So um, that, that's basically how, you know, some of the first PCPs that we had were built BF, BFL and BFLS. And something that I want to point out is that in this entire construction, the verifier only needs to make a single query to the polynomial P. And also we can use a constant round version of the sum check protocol to get uh, a protocol with overall communication square root n. Okay, so if you lost me in this couple of slides, you know, don't worry about it. Let's see what we have so far. We have an IOP in which the prover sends over x hat, which is really long. It's a problem for him to solve it. The verifier checks that this x hat is close to a multilinear polynomial. The parties run the sum check protocol on the polynomial P. And then the, the single query that the verifier wanted to make to the polynomial P can be emulated by making three queries to the polynomial x hat. And this is simply because of the way that P was defined, it just defined was, uh, it only depended on I sub phi and on three points of x hat. Okay, so this is how our IOP looks so far. And as I mentioned, the problem is that we can't really afford for the prover to send over x hat. And the key insight in, my, uh, in our work is that rather than having the prover send over x hat, we're going to have the prover send over an encoding of x via some other code, a high rate code, so that later on using additional interaction, you can emulate queries to x hat that you want using a more interaction with the prover. Okay, so this is kind of the key insight. And once you have that insight, the paper kind of writes itself. So, so let's go through that. But questions? Ron, so Ron, uh, yeah, is there a more generic version of this? Some kind of a way of uh, you know, maybe identifying a broader class of applications in which the same kind of idea can apply? Some, um, kind, of a, some kind of a hybrid uh, PCP or hybrid codes that you, you want a code uh, you have an application that depends on a code that has extra properties and now you replace it with a generic code and so right, absolutely so I, I certainly do view it as an interactive reduction between codes mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting to kind of formulate that uh, yeah I, th I think one more data point of, of an application could could be could justify this just doing it uh, without an extra application but it does seem like a more general more right. generally so, useful idea. There's a follow-up work of uh, um, of Budo, Chiesa, and Groth, which kind of takes a similar approach and, and also uh, relies on the simulation. I think there the spirit is, is fairly similar. Um, it would be nice to find kind of broader broader things that you can do. Okay. Um, okay. So what do we want? 
we want a code C that is one uh, high rate, right? It's rate is close to one. We want to be locally testable and correctable. So just to ensure that the prover has to send over essentially a code word. And we want that, you know, as long as I have Oracle access to this, to CFX, there's some way for me to emulate queries to X hat using additional interaction with the prover. So that's kind of what we're looking for. And the way that we're going to do this is using something that's called tensor codes. So what are tensor codes? They're a beautiful object that I really like, which work as follows. So it's kind of a way to uh, take a code and construct from it a new code that has very useful properties. So take your favorite linear code C, mapping K bits to N bits. I'm going to define a new code C squared, whose input is now K squared bits and its output is now N squared bits. And the mapping works as follows. Whoops. So this is the way the mapping works first. Uh, so you take your message, you view it as a matrix and N by a K by K matrix. First thing that you do is encode each one of the rows using the code C. And then you encode each one of the columns, including the new columns that you added, again, using the code C. Kind of if you're you know, wondering why we did it first rows and then columns, turns out that it doesn't matter. You can uh, work that out. So this turns out to be a very useful way of constructing codes just to uh, you know, get a feel for the, for the code in terms of the rate of the code. It used to be K over N, now it became, became K squared over N squared, so the rate squared. And it's also not too hard to show that the distance also squares when using this transformation. So these are tensor codes. And we're going to use for our code C, a high rate tensor code. So for example, what you can do is take your favorite plain old high rate code C mapping say square root n bits to just a little bit more than square root n bits. So this is a high rate code and you can construct such code with constant relative distance. And now you look at C squared. What, what do we know about C squared? Well, for one thing, it has high rate because the rate just squares. And you know, if you square something that's close to one, you get something that's close to one. Turns out that it's locally testable and there's an asterisk there. So you know, there are some quirks about this, but I don't want to get into it. And you know, so this follows from a result of, of Viderman, basically. And turns out it also satisfies local correction, which is something that we need. And this is something that we showed in a joint work together with Tom Gore and Govid uh, Ramanyana from Yaran uh, a couple of years ago. And this is kind of a certain relaxation of local correction that's good enough for PCP, for, for our application. Okay, so you know we wanted the code C, it satisfies the first two bullets. We're just left with the last bullet. We want that given Oracle access to CFX, we have an IOP for emulating queries to X hat. So how do we do this? And you know, first observation is that because X hat is a linear code, you can express the evaluation of X hat at a point I as just a linear combination of the bits of X. And that's what happens for linear codes. And for a second, let's kind of hide these coefficients, these annoying coefficients, and imagine that we're just looking at the sum of the entries of X. Right, so we want to compute the sum of the entries of X given Oracle access to C of X. And the way that we're going to do this is by uh, using the sum check protocol as applied to tensor code. And again, this comes from the beautiful work of, of Ormir. And the idea works as follows. So this is, for those familiar with the sum check code, it's really just an uh, abstraction of that for general tensor codes rather than just like uh, multivariate polynomials. So we have our input code word C and we're interested say in the sum of the blue part, sum over the blue part. So the way that the protocol works is that our prover is going to sum up all of the, the, in this case, the first three columns, okay, which is what we're interested in, but it takes the sum you know, of the entire thing, both the blue and the orange, and sends over this sum to the verifier. That's this kind of call tilde that we're sending. First thing that the verifier checks is that call tilde is indeed a code word. And notice that if the prover is trying to cheat and you know, trying to convince the verifier that the sum is wrong, it has to send over an incorrect code word. This call, call tilde will not be the actual uh, sum of what's going on in C. And we're going to catch that by choosing a random coordinate i, i star, and checking whether you know, the, i, the i star entry of what the prover sent is consistent with the code word C that we have in our hand. And we do this by just kind of reading off the i star row of C. 
And once we've done that, you know, we can safely assume that call tilde was computed correctly and the sum of the entries of its blue part will kind of give us the result that we're looking for. So that is uh, how we do um, sum check for general tensor codes, including for our high rate tensor code. But unfortunately, you know, this uh, hiding hand doesn't exist in reality. We do have coefficient and doesn't seem as though, at least I don't know how to extend sum check to check general linear relations, of, you know, general, uh, general coefficients. In classical PCPs, this comes up, but this is kind of easy to resolve by just taking, you know, the thing, the um, coefficients that you care about, thinking of them somehow as a code word and multiplying them, multiplying C by them pointwise. That kind of plugs in the coefficients and you can do some check on the resulting, you know, product code word. But we don't have a multiplication code, but nevertheless, and this is again following uh, Orr's work, it turns out that you can extend the sum check protocol as long as your coefficient matrix has rank one. And luckily enough, it turns out that our coefficient matrix does have rank one. And this has to, do, uh, has to do with the fact that X hat itself is a tensor code. Okay, and that's basically it. So just as a digest of what was going on, what we did is used you know, the incredible, unbelievable power of the sum check protocol to switch between different tensor codes as required. So we use the high rate tensor code, you know, to actually encode the computation, but using sum check, we were able to switch over as kind of also Yuval was hinting uh, at to a different tensor code, which is a multiplication code. And that's the code that let us check nonlinear relations. Okay, so Yuval, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, so just, uh, if you try to use uh, like uh, direct constructions of codes that have right high rate and are like multiplicity codes, right? That have uh, that are locally correctable and uh, locally testable. I assume. Um, I mean, maybe it's an overkill. Maybe it's not enough. But what is the? So if they're high rate, they won't. So uh, you're asking about uh, using multiplicity codes for as the high rate code or as uh, I see. Okay, so it's not okay. You, you said that you want a high rate code. That's a code you switch to, right? It doesn't need to be multipl multiplication code, but it needs to right. have high rate and be locally testable and locally. No, it doesn't need to be anything. It just, it just needs to be high rate and I'm oh, oh, right, right. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Just by tensoring, I get everything I want. So, right, but, uh, okay, yeah. So by tensoring, you get everything you want. My question is if you if you use instead code, uh, maybe it's not useful for you, but those kinds of explicit multiplicity codes have high rate and um, they have uh, these very nice uh, self-correction properties. And uh, you know, it's, it's basically these very explicit codes that maybe can be viewed as some fancy type of tensored codes. Will it, can it be useful? So can you use uh, something better than uh, just uh, direct and so one thing maybe to point out about local correction is, you know, people work really hard to get locally decodable and locally correctable codes. And, mm -hmm. you know, incredibly difficult area. But in the context of PCPs, there's this notion of relaxed local correction, which basically means that, you know, if when trying to decode, you uh, encounter any kind of corruption, you're allowed to just mm -hmm. abort. Right. Yeah. Turns out that that makes life way, way, way easier. So I see, I like see but, but an overkill to be aiming. I mean, maybe you could use multiplication codes and get even better relaxed self-correction and so forth. Mm -hmm. But so, somehow, you know, strict self-correction seems like an overkill for in this application. Okay. For, for instance, if you wanted to reduce the round complexity of your IOP and still to the limit and still get uh, similar characteristics, uh, I assume that the uh, fancier types of codes that maybe are non-existent, but fancier types of codes would help you do it. So True. the question is, is there some abstraction of the fancier type of code that would help you do it? And does it exist? Um, so what you, so like instead of doing the single tensoring, uh, do you know some higher degree tensoring or something like so this? The, so the higher degree tensoring actually it's not good. No, higher degree tensoring you yeah. will lose too much in the rate. But I'm saying that something that has the same effect without losing the rate, and and for, to this end maybe some explicit algebraic constructions might uh, help. Right. I mean, 
in my mind, and I think, and it's, it was essentially proved in, in this follow-up work by Ella that I'll mention later, that this general idea can be useful, you know, you can uh, switch whatever code you want in the first part, it has certain properties that you care about, say efficiency, and then another code, which you don't need to actually materialize in the second part. So even doing, even encoding by Reed Solomon in the first part, but packing together all the symbols rather than encoding using each bit individually, as is usually mm -hmm. done, that already, mm -hmm. I think, would, would buy you something. Okay. Uh, definitely Thanks. in terms of concrete efficiency, I think that would be useful. So maybe to, to, to add to this discussion, the way that I personally like to think about uh, uh, this very nice idea is that you start out with an IOP where your queries are in a richer set rather than being point queries are like some function of the Oracle. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case uh, with run, it would be like, you know, multi uh, multi-linear queries uh, to uh, uh, the message, right? And you know, you go ahead and design uh, your IOP in this uh, uh, um, dream world that is not really real, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you're left with this uh, kind of very, let's say, specific task, which is every query that the prover uh, so claimed an answer for for this uh, rich query set. Now you have to implement using normal point queries, mm -hmm. and so now you have this sub problem of coming up with uh, basically an IOP of proximity for a claim that says this thing encoded according the way that you want that the IOP of proximity decides. Mm -hmm. This is the answer, and this is the query in this rich set. Mm -hmm. uh, so and and it could you, you could run things like fry to check to check uh... right. And uh, it's plausible that you may have, you know, some fancy codes where maybe not by running some check, but by running some other uh, algebraic thing, you might be able to answer to implement using point queries some other types of uh, a, a richer query sets, and maybe those richer query sets would facilitate some other interesting uh, properties, which could be maybe even just concrete efficiency. Who knows, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's very, it's very likely. I think. I mean, I, I would guess that there are interesting things to be said there uh, in that direction. Uh, so you and, and how tight, and Ron, back to one, how tight is the trade-off here between the round complexity of the IOP, IOP and the other parameters? Like uh, what, what well, could you we, hope we to get? Really need to, uh, you know, everything that's hap essentially happening is just some checks and we really need a very low, uh, we're not, you know, fiddling with a number of rounds. We need some check, like a three round version of some checks say or two round mm -hmm. version of some check. Mm -hmm. uh, how much further you can push it? I would, I believe it can be improved. For example, and if instead of using um, this kind of BFLS style PCP that we're using internally, if we use mm -hmm. something uh, kind of a short, P, or a shorter PCP, which mm -hmm. has, you know, quasi linear length, I, I think that would buy you um, a, an extra round that you can save. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me go back. Okay, so so far we just talked about three stat and also query complexity with square root n. So let me tell you about how we extend the result. Turns out that that's uh, much easier than what we've done so far. So in terms of handling, uh, it's not working. Handling, you know, general bounded polynomial space relations, then using uh, this work together with Omer and Guy, in that work we constructed a constant round interactive proof for um, any bounded space relation or any bounded space language. Um, so things that you can compute in polynomial time, fixed bounded polynomial space. And in this result, the verifier only needs to make a single query to the low degree extension of the input. So what we can do in terms of constructing this, uh, our IOP is follow the same framework as before. The prover sends over a high rate encoding of the witness. But now we're going to run the, this RRR protocol on the imaginary low degree extension of the witness, which no one, which you know the verifier doesn't have. But at the end of the protocol, the verifier you know, spits out a claim about the low degree extension at a particular point. And now we can use you know, this lin check, this you know, sum check with linear with tensor coefficients to check that uh, w hat of i is actually equal to v. Okay, so it's kind of plug and play. Instead of using BFLS, we switch to this RRR protocol. So that's how we handle uh, bounded polynomial space. To reduce the query complexity to, down from square root n to a constant, we use a very uh, simple idea or 
a beautiful and complex idea, but which right now I think people will understand well, called a proof composition. So the idea would be that instead of directly querying the square root endpoints that you want to uh, check something about, you have the prover send over a PCP string proving that if you had read these points, you would accept. Or to be more accurate, what you need is something that's called a PCP of proximity. And I don't want to kind of get into what that means, but you can more or less think of it as a PCP in which you don't, you, you also make a few queries into the input. And to actually make this all work, you it's technically a bit annoying. You need to make sure that everything is robust, meaning that you know the square root n query verifier, not only would it reject with high probability, but rather the what it would see, the square root and things that it would see would be far from anything that would make it accept. But again, I don't want to get into the details of that, but I'm, I'm happy to uh, elaborate if people are, are interested either uh, at the end of the talk or offline. Okay, so just to summarize, our main result was kind of this theorem too, which shows that any NP problem with a, it can be verified in bound polynomial space has an IOP with a constant number of rounds, constant query complexity, and where the entire communication is just barely beyond sending you know, the unencoded witness. In terms of uh, some open problems that I'm interested in, well, you know, the most basic open problem that's left is, you know, get short PCPs for circuit set. You know, we introduced more interaction. Can you do it without any interaction? Let me point out that there are two different directions that you can take this to. One is to improve the query complexity of uh, the result that I mentioned of uh, Ben Sasson uh, and others. But another is, you know, can we construct a high rate PCP with any non-trivial query complexity, right? So the known uh, constant rate PCP has pretty terrible, it's constant rate, but the rate is pretty terrible, it's close to zero. Can you do anything non-trivial with rate close to one? That I find that really interesting. And one reason to hope is that turns out that in the closely related uh, research area of locally testable codes, something like this is known. Um, so, I'm really hoping uh, someone comes up with such a result for PCPs. Another, you know, very tempting open question that I've thought about uh, quite a bit and have some initial thoughts, but not, not anything uh, too exciting is that, can you use IOPs to get better hardness of approximation results? Okay, because we, we do have these short IOPs. PCPs are very fundamentally related to hardness of approximation. Can you use IOPs as well? Uh, third question is, you know, our, this, our result was limited to bounded polynomial space relations. Can we get rid of this limitation and handle all of NP with IOPs that uh, approach the witness length? And you know, either a positive or a negative result would be cool here. I mean, at first glance, it's tempting to think that you should, can show a negative result, but at least to me, it's not clear. Um, lastly, you know, we said that one of the main motivations for short PCPs is to improve the prover running time. And you know, now that we have these shorter IOPs, can we also improve the prover running time? And it turns out that the answer to this is yes. And this is a, a follow-up work of uh, Boodle, Kiesa, and Groth, which uh, builds on our techniques and constructs IOPs in which the prover runs in, or its size as an arithmetic circuit is linear. So it only needs to do a linear number of arithmetic operations over some sufficiently large field. And I'll uh, stop here and oops, happy to take uh, any additional questions. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, I, I did want to say uh, uh, we're probably going to start maybe five minutes late in the next talk just so that we have like a 10 minute break in between. And also, I don't see much in a reason for this 10 minutes to switch over to gather.town. I think whoever wants to kind of hang around here to ask questions or just chit chat. Uh, maybe this is a good place to do that given many of the number of people. But yeah, go ahead then. Uh, uh, is there any talks? Uh, some talks, uh, questions? So, a question to Ale the follow up work is um, something that uh, appeared at TCC, or I'm, I'm not sure I'm. Uh, so, so, this is the follow up work that uh, Ron is referring to, the TCC paper. Yeah, and, and uh, you will hear more about it uh, in Jonathan's talk, I think, on uh, Wednesday. Okay, great. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Um,
So yeah. one, if I if I cared only about epsilon equals one, meaning uh, double, doubling the. Um, yes. So doubling the the length, and then the. Uh, so the beginning, you said that we have such codes, just that the rate is bounded like by half. Right. That, that's it. I mean, that's an upper bound. The best multiplication codes that we have uh, don't achieve this. So the, the closest thing would be AG codes. And that would essentially be, uh, if you follow that route, you would, this is essentially what this prior work of, of Allen and others that get constant rate uh, does. I see. So okay. it would give you a constant rate. Um, oh. But the constant is somewhat limited. For arithmetic circuits, you can get uh, you can use Reed Solomon codes and get uh, rate one half, essentially. But it's slightly more complicated, right? Because you have to consider potentially either a tensor code, or if you are using the the, the multiplication property, then your rate is going to kind of go down when you multiply two code words together. Mm -hmm. So you will find yourself after the multiplication. Sorry. I think you still need a little bit of distance also after the multiplication. Yeah, so I think you might go down to like a fourth and an eighth. Uh, it may be an interesting question to see whether you can sort of start with the multiplication code and end up with the rate uh, 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 at one half for the whole protocol. Like, I'm not sure how to carry it, I mean, all the way to the end of the protocol in that case. It also depends on how you uh, arithmetize, because, uh, I mean, if you're Depends a little bit if you're uh, if you try to do PCP things rather than IOP things, the arithmetization will also introduce overhead. But if you're already doing IOP things, then why not kind of do this code switching thing? Yeah, right. The solution exists, so you need to have a good reason to to somehow rule it out. Uh, yeah. Maybe uh, one thing that I wanted to say and forgot is. Um, you know, this work of Ormeir, I already mentioned, really influenced our work. And something that I find interesting is that that work came out of like really pure theory. He was basically asking, you know, can we build proof systems without using algebra? And it was kind of, a, you know, he was, it was a, for him, it was a natural question. It was kind of a scientific curiosity. I don't think he, uh, anyone realized at the time that his techniques would have, and I think it goes beyond our work. I think it's really influenced uh, a lot of recent works on IOPs. Um, but it, it once again shows that asking, you know, basic natural research questions leads to interesting and unexpected results. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, but maybe people are watching offline. What yeah. is your belief regarding three? Sorry? What is your belief regarding question three? I started off, I mean, saying, you know, obviously it's false, but then, you know, I, I, I'm no longer sure because, um, you know, you start off trying to throw lower bands that you have for PCPs against this, but they, they break down once you switch to IOPs and you try to uh, throw lower bands that you have for interactive proofs on it, but they also break down. Um, so like the, the naive thing, the, the immediate things that I could think of in terms of lower bounds didn't work. And in terms of upper bounds, um, you know, the main idea that I have is using these doubly efficient interactive proofs and they only work for, you know, either bounded space or bounded depth. So and it's this real and, for, and for that Sorry? specific approach, we don't believe that we can generalize it further, right? Right, so. absolutely. So it would need, so an upper bound would need a fundamentally different approach and it seems, and the lower bound, as far as I can see, would also need a fundamentally different approach. So it's this weird situation where I don't know what the truth is or don't have a good guess even. And also, whatever techniques one uses, they have to be sensitive to polynomial factors because we do have IOPs where the proof length depends polynomial on the witness length, right? Uh, that is just the normal uh, kind of IPC. Uh, no, but, but, but that is uh, so that is either for if you use like, like Kalai Raza use GKR, that's for bounded depth relations. Well, you can just do it for BFL, I mean, the BFLS construction. That, then it would be the circuit size, not the witness, not the witness length. Oh, no, you're right, you're right, yes. Okay, Okay. so that maybe makes it uh, uh, more easier to- Yeah, so, so even, uh, you know, even fixed polynomial in the witness for, uh, for NP. Yeah. yeah. Is, uh, is open as far as I can see. Yeah, you're right.
Um, okay, so we're reaching uh, uh, 10 a.m. California time, uh, different time in different time zones. Let's do five, maybe like a five minute uh, uh, break before uh, Elon's, uh, I mean, stick around and do it, and I'll do my, do my own break. Uh, so let's start uh, in five minutes with uh, the next uh, talk. Oh. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And thank you so much, uh, Ron. It was, I think uh, uh, I'm very happy we, we are recording because it was like really, truly an excellent uh, talk, you know, in the setting up stage, not just for your work, but uh, I think it, uh, it was, it was uh, very good uh, uh, for bringing people in from nearby areas. Thank you. Clearly put a lot of work into it. Appreciate it.